Hello, my name is Rich Wareham, and in this talk I'd like to present some adventures I've had with playing with GIS datasets in IPython. The aim of the talk is to be an introduction to how you, as a uh, person wanting to deal with geographic data, can play with IPython yourself and see if you can start to do some interesting things with it. I present not only an introduction to what GIS is and how to actually do um, some things with GIS data, I'll also present a very, very brief introduction to IPython, just so that you can get yourself started and you know some of the terms I'll be using during the talk. This is no substitute for actually going and having a look at one of the excellent web tutorials which exist for Python, or in fact reading any of the wonderful books that are written about Python. But uh, hopefully, as I said, it should let you get started and follow what I'm talking about. And I'll be using particularly the IPython web notebook view, which I think is a very, very convenient and very useful tool uh, in order to be able to rapidly play with data and see what happens and change things and do things. And when I actually talk about start talking about GIS data sets themselves, I'm going to have a brief show about how um, a brief talk about how you can show the the pitfalls of things like pixelization and uh, why a raster data can sometimes be a bit funny and I'll talk about how to clean up some messy data that you might get um, from the web. So. so moving straight on, first of all, what is GIS? Well, as the Wikipedia page on GIS says, uh, a geographic information system, this, as a term, is a very relatively broad term. This is an un understatement indeed. In essence, GIS means anything where computers touch things which happen on the ground. Uh, that can be rows, it can be maps, it can be plotting locations of things, it can be planning uh, pipelines, anything where that involves a computer could be called a GIS system. So to that end, I'm going to um, restrict my discussions in this talk to raster GIS data, which is essentially associating a particular pixel value with some place on the Earth's surface, and particularly elevation data, which tells you the height of the Earth's surface at a particular pixel value. I'll just give a brief tour of other solutions which are available. So ArcGIS is a very, very capable program. It's uh, very large, it's very complete, it's quite complicated, um, but it's not really set up for doing research. It's not very much geared towards playing with data, which I suppose is to be expected and very fair because it's not there to be played with. It's there to get a job done, to generate a plot when you know ahead of time what you want to generate. Now, as a researcher, I often find the first week's worth of work I do on something is just playing. It's getting hold of data, playing with it, plotting it, doing various things, seeing if you can get a handle on how it all fits together. ArcGIS is, uh, I don't think, terribly good at letting you play. It's very good at letting you plot when you know what you want to do, and it's very good at letting you uh, do standard analyses, but it's not very good at letting you discover things for yourself. Uh, another GIS software is GrassGIS, which is uh, an open source uh, solution, and it is also quite complicated. Very complete, very useful, very clever and very powerful, but quite hard to use. Again, not very good ear towards play. You can generate some exceptionally pretty plots with it. Here's a, an example screenshot I've taken from their website, and you can see that indeed you can fuse um, vector data to do with roads, uh, map data, you can generate some very, very exciting good looking plots. I'll also just pretty point out that you may be using GIS software and not really realizing it. So for example, uh, I'd say that Google Maps itself is a form of GIS software. And you can see here I presented a map, I've uh, got a overlaid some terrain data in nicely shaded for me, I've got roads overlaid and I've got two points marked. In fact I, here I've got Stonehenge and uh, Avery which is a, another set of standing stones marked on the map. You can only do a certain number of things with Google Maps. It's nowhere near as powerful as other GIS solutions. But for rapidly getting an overview of an area, it's very useful. And in fact, this is the area I'll be using as a case study. Uh, we'll be seeing how in IPython you can load in the very terrain data that um, Google Maps is currently displaying and seeing if you can't plot something that looks similarly pretty. So having a brief tour of what GIS is, what is IPython? Well, IPython is... Uh, available for download from ipython.org and it's a, uh, a variant on the Python language actually is the Python language under the covers but the I stands for interactive and the whole point of it is that uh, it allows you to very rapidly uh, iterate on an idea and get rapid feedback on something rather than having to again structure your program as if you know ahead of time what it's going to do it lets you very quickly 
do things, play with things, see where things go, and those kind of things. And I'm going to be combining IPython with something called Matplotlib, which is a very powerful uh, plotting library for Python. And in fact, IPython um, talks very nicely to Matplotlib, and we'll see that it in a moment, where I launch it with a special command line parameter, which actually preloads the entirety of Matplotlib straight into it, so you can get going straight away. So um, I'm going to do a quick introduction to IPython for you now, and you start it very simply by typing IPython. I want the notebook view, which is a web-based um, inter interface to it, and if I type in dash dash pylab, it will preload in a lot of the plotting utilities that I might need without me having to do anything else. And it's actually created a new tab in this, and I want that to actually be up on this desktop the way of such things with demos they never quite work so let's have a quick look at uh, an introduction to python now this is the um ipython notebook view you can see there's a see some controls up on the side here and a notebook consists of a number of cells and each cell can be one of these uh text cells where a little bit of essentially wiki like formatting can be put in or one of these code cells you can actually type some code and the thing which makes this particularly powerful is that you can highlight a cell and press shift enter and that cell will be evaluated the code inside it will be run now python like many programming languages has got uh, these things called variables so here in this first cell i'm making a equals to 2 and b equals to 4. so if i evaluate it nothing happened python's listened to me it's not complained it's done what i've said if i now ask what a plus b is by pressing shift enter you see that it gets six out and I can assign that value straight to another variable so shift enter and C is now assigned the value of a plus B if I change I can also change a variable so shift enter and then a plus B and now a plus B is nine as you might expect now that hasn't changed anything that's happened up here when I did this bit of code a was actually equal to two so C should be equal to six here and if I actually look at it it still is equal to six so this is not say this is not a thing that says forevermore c will always be a plus b. It says take what the value is of a plus b at the moment and put it into c. Now I can put other things in variables as well. I can put little bits of text. They're called strings, and I can tell the difference between text and numbers by putting these little quotes around it. And you see that the IPython web notebook nicely sort of highlights the text you write so you get some idea of what's going on. So if I do that and that we see that we get hello world as you'd expect and possibly confusingly for newcomers there is um, a difference between the text digit three and the number three so if i assign a and b to these two bits of text and do a plus b you see i get three followed by the digit four it's done exactly the same as hello world has up here so you might want to make sure you don't get confused by those sort of things you can uh, store actual lumps of code in in something called functions and here we have we're going to define two functions one called doublet which takes some number in and it will assign it temporarily to the variable x and return x times two and multiply them which takes two numbers in and returns what happens when you multiply them so if i run double it and the way in which i cause that function to actually run is putting these brackets around it so double it one I haven't pressed shift enter on this cell, so I haven't actually defined it. There we go. Double it one, you get two. And if I have to multiply them five and six, I get 30. And you can be quite complicated here. So you can see that you can nest these uh, calls to functions and you can put whatever you want inside the brackets as long as it turns into a number. And you see you get 50. Now, also there's a print, which is a function like thing in Python version three. It actually is a function which can display things. So here I'm going to print out one hello, hello, and then world, and also the result of doubling it on six. And you can see it prints out directly for me. You can grab code which has been written by other people. They're called modules in Python by using the import keyword. Now, uh, what that has done is it's taken a large number of variables and functions and hidden them away um, underneath the datetime namespace is what it's called and essentially what it means is you put datetime dot in front of things to be able to get hold of it so to get a hold of the variable max year which has been defined in this module i have to put datetime dot in front of it and that gives me the maximum year that this module can represent these can be nested within each other so you see here that datetime has got something called date in it which has then got some a function called day in it if i call today I get back today's date 
Now, this particular bit here, datetime.date, .date, is a special sort of namespace, and this is called an object. Now, an object is not only uh, the func a set of functions, but it's also a lump of data of which those functions operate on specially. So, for example, if I assign t, uh, the variable of datetime.date.today, it has a number of variables which are associated with just that particular value of t, and uh, they'll change if this, this were a different object. So, example here, you can see this. And it can also have functions which work just with that particular set of data. So they are it's printed out in a particular um, format for that date. Arrays are exceptionally useful. They are essentially 1 and 2D squares of numbers. So here you can see 1, 2, 3 turns into the array 1, 2, 3. And if I do 1, 2, 3, 4 with this sort of uh, nested bracket syntax, I end up with a 2D array. And I can uh, access individual elements from this array using square brackets. So if I define A to be an array and print it, you see this is the array we get. Now each number is associated with its row, which is the vertical displacement, and its column, which is the horizontal displacement. And you get it out by using these square brackets. So for example, uh, the first number here is the row and the second number is the column. So this will give me the zeroth row and the zeroth column, which will be this one, this upper left number here. In computing, very usually, uh, it's very often the case that uh, things like this are indexed from zero and not from one. So you might have to adjust your brain to make that work. It gets one as you'd expect. The zeroth row and first column gives me two, which is this element here. And the uh, row two and column one will be row zero, one, two, column one, this one here, the eight. You can uh, use the colon symbol to mean everything in that either row or column. So here, by putting colon in, I mean everything that could go here. And this has given me basically everything where the column is 1. So column 1 here would be 2, 5, 8, 11, and I get 2, 5, 8, 11 out. And I can do the same thing for rows. So this is everything where row is 0. So I should get 1, 2, 3 out. And I do. Arrays um, have some useful function variables attached to them. They are objects. So for example, min is a function which will give me the minimum number in this array, max, the maximum number, and shape is a special variable which gives me how many rows and columns it is. So you can see here that I have the minimum value is 1, the maximum value is 12, and it is 4 rows by 3 columns. The ravel function is very useful indeed. It takes a 2D array and somewhat misnomerly unravels it into a 1D array by walking across. So here's the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and that's what we've come out. And you can uh, reshape an array using the reshape function, which essentially unravels it like this and then re-ravels it into a different shape. So here um, I'm going to ravel it in something with three rows and four columns, and also with two rows and six columns. And there we go. And that should be enough Python for you to get started. Now, how can we actually manipulate GIS data within Python? There is a, um, a very good um, module which you can get uh, for Python called GDEL. And I've just imported it into my Python script here. And this will allow you to load in a large amount of raster data for GIS. And these are things like height maps. Now, if I look and see in my current directory, you can see I've got something called dtm21.tiff, and this is something called a geotiff, and this is going to give this actually is the height map for the area we were just looking at on Google Maps, and I can load this in using gdel using a, a special function inside it called open, and one of the very nice things about IPython's web notebook view is if I start typing something and hit tab, it will give me a list of completions, so I can often be quite lazy in my typing. Let's assign this to a variable. Let's just call it A. And now that's an object which represents this data on the disk. So if I hit A dot and hit tab, you can see there's all of these things that I can do with it. So one of them, for example, would be raster X size, which is a variable which gives me the uh, number of horizontal pixels in this raster. Now, there's a, a slight um, issue with raster data. Uh, which is to do with the fact that it's essentially trying to take something which is uh, a flat 2D image and represent the 3D Earth. If 
I have a look at this, this is how it works. So you start with the real world, the actual Earth, which is a sort of wobbly ball thing. It's not a sphere, it's not an oblate spheroid, it's just a wobbly ball thing. And you can unravel this into a map using something called a projection. And of course, the wobbly ball thing is how the world really is, and the projection is um, a made up view of the world so that we can actually put it onto a piece of paper. Obviously, a piece of paper is not a sphere, and a sphere is not even the world, so no matter what we do, this is always going to be slightly wrong in some respect. And we can, if we are very clever with our projection, very careful with our projection, convert it into what's called a linear scale. This is essentially distances in meters. So if I was to mark two points on my map, if my map is sufficiently uh, well made, I should be able to measure the distance between those two points in meters. And I put a, an arrow up here saying between real world and fantasy in the sense that this is something which actually exists in the world and meters is something which we as human beings have invented. And the whole point of GIS software in general is to help us mediate between the real world and this sort of fantasy world. So going back to our GIS data, let's actually try and display it on screen. Well, we can uh, read actually the data as an array using, unsurprisingly, a function called read as array. Now this will give me the height um, data for this area. Now before I try and plot it, um, just a quick gotcha. If we look at the maximum value of this data, it's about 300 meters. That's not entirely surprising. If we look at the minimum value. It's some crazy number. What's this? Minus three by 10 or whatever. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and this is essentially the magic number that this data set is using to represent. I don't know what the height is here. So actually we need to do our first bit of filtering before we can actually display it, which is to filter out these values. So in actual fact, I'm not going to take the raw data. I'm going to take the maximum value between zero and that data. And that's going to essentially just chop up anything that's in this sort of strange area. And we can use our first matplotlib function, which is called imshow, which shows an image, which can be used to just show that data. And here we are. So let me just arrange my windows nicely for us. And this is the height data. And you see that it's not 100% dissimilar to this um, uh, data area we have here. So it's particularly this sort of plane, Salisbury plane in fact, is nicely represented here. There is a problem, of course, with this rastation in the sense that these are pixels. You can see here that along the bottom I've got pixel coordinates, and along the top here I've also got pixel coordinates. And a raster data set is fundamentally a set of pixel squares. Now, these pixel squares are tended to be defined as terms of squares in terms of projection coordinates. Unfortunately, we've got an example here, if you actually uh, draw this square of projection coordinate, it doesn't actually turn into a square in the real world in most of the cases. And furthermore, if you then just try to multiply these projection coordinates by some number to get into meters, it works even less good, even less well, particularly if you use something like degrees of latitude and longitude. Now, how many meters a degree of latitude actually is depends on where you are on the Earth, and the same with the degree of longitude as well. And so this actually no, actually no, sorry, degree of longitude depends on where you are on the Earth. Degree of latitude kind of doesn't, actually. But um, it, in essence, you have to be very careful with this sort of thing. So in order to try and make this, this easier, I've um, created a little wrapper around this GDAL thing uh, called PyGIS. It just happened to be a name I gave it. So if we open up another notebook, let's leave that page here. and I'll show you how this works. What you can do is it's uh, unsurprisingly called PyGIS. Let's create a figure which we can start to plot some things on. And let's load in this data set that we have and uh, it's an elevation data set and we've got it elev. Um, Uh -huh. Oops. 
Oh yes, silly me. There we go. Um, I forgot to actually call call it by its real name, and that's opened this raster data set for us there. And um, I can show that using the handy show raster function that PyJS provides. And here we are, very much thing. We haven't had to do that filtering. It's PyJS has sorted out filtering out the non-values into appropriate um, pixel values, which won't screw up when we try to plot the image. There's also some useful things that you can get out of this object. If I hit tab, you see there's all manner of things down here. Um, one of the interesting ones would be proj extent, which gives you the minimum and maximum uh, or the left and right projection coordinates and top and bottom projection coordinates. Now, what are these projection coordinates? Well, I've told you that uh, you, you can't simply take your pixel squares and multiply your projection um, coordinates by some number and hope to get meters out if they're latitudes and longitudes. But the question is, how well do we get away with it if we kind of just ignore that? If we choose some projection where it's sort of all right, uh, and generally we can get away with it, and it turns out uh, it's not bad, actually. If you choose your projection carefully, you can get a uh, linear scale pretty well out, certainly to the level to which we'll be worrying about it in this example. And the projection that we'll actually be using in this data, and this is the data set uh, projection I have, is something called the British National Grid. Uh, and it's nothing to do with electricity uh, distribution. I just happened to find a website where um, a large number of people go out and take photos of pylons and post them on the internet for all to see. And this was such an exciting concept, I couldn't resist putting it in this presentation. But the British National Grid essentially works by taking um, a cylinder, wrapping it around the Earth, uh, where it touches a north-south line through Britain, and projecting there from. And you end up with a grid over Britain like this. So this red line is the line of where it touches the cylinder. And it the meters do get slightly less good as you go uh, east and west of the uh, the red line, but they're sufficiently good that um, for our purposes it doesn't matter. The particular data we have actually corresponds to this SU grid square down here, and um, this is the data set that includes uh, Stonehenge and Avery. Now I said that it gets progressively worse as you go east and west of this line, which means that essentially the British National Grid only really works for Britain, and won't really work for converting meters anywhere else. Now this might be a problem you think if you're not living in Britain, but one of the joys about Britain is that we have no problem whatsoever in ignoring the needs of anyone who doesn't live here. Moving back to our actual data set now, you can see that this is the British National Grid coordinates, and it happens to be that one unit of the British National Grid is one meter, which is very convenient. So if we look and see what our linear scale is, as in uh, what we have to multiply our projection coordinates to get meters, we find out that it's one. How very, very convenient. If we actually do wanted to know what the uh, um, projection of this data set was, um, that's not what we want, we want projection. We can print it out in something called well known text format. And here you can see it's the British National Grid. Um, a meter is one unit of this, and various other technical information to do with the. Um, actual projection. We can get hold of the actual data that corresponds to this uh, using the data variable underlying elev, so elev data, and you can see that's an array with all our actual numbers in it, and that gives us our heights. I've also implemented, um, in fact we can see the heights if I do that, and you can see that we've got a, a colour bar that nicely shows how high these um, parts are here. I implemented um, something which gets you slightly more useful knowledge out than just these slopes and aspects, and this is all part of the PyGS library. So, for example, you can get a uh, slope, which is the ratio of how high you go, how many meters up you go for every one meter across you go, and you can get that using the um, elevation slope function and pass it what you want to do. So, there, and you can get something called the aspect, which is the direction the steeper slope points in. Using that. And now we can plot these nicely using our 
uh, clf by the way clears the function uh, clears the current figure so we'll clear all the stuff that we've done here so let's so for example let's show the slope the brighter the pixel here the more slope there is in that area of the ground this is not necessarily the best uh, coloring of pixels we can use and in fact we can put things like uh, the cmap arguments at the end of show raster and select um, a one of a number of color maps uh, I happen to know that I think spectral is quite good for this data set so maybe I'll spectral shift enter and there we go it sort of pops it out a bit I think uh, if you want to see a list of these color maps um, unsurprisingly Google is your friend and there we go there's a list of what they actually look like so you can choose whichever one you want uh, where were we? It's this one, isn't it? There we go. So that's the slope. Um, I can also show the aspect, and that gives you the orientation of the slope. You can see it's a bit more crinkly than you might have uh, initially thought. The um, if we actually put a color bar on this, you can see that the aspect goes from uh, minus two pi to uh, minus pi to pi, and these are the angle of the slope in rate uh, the angle of the aspect in radians. Because angles join up, uh, 360 degrees is the same as zero degrees, actually we prefer to have a colour map which had the same colour down at the bottom as, as at the top here. And if we look um, on the list of colour maps, the HSV colour map is one that actually does that. It's got red on both ends, so we can change that to HSV. And there we are. Uh, I don't think humans are very good at understanding either slope or aspect maps, to be entirely honest with you. We don't really uh, process them as uh, human beings. So I also implemented uh, something I'll call in BOSS. I don't know what the actual GIS name for it is, because I am barely two weeks into knowing anything about this. But um, it's you can get it with the elevation in BOSS. Um, and we'll pass in uh, what was it? LF, wasn't it? And if we show that raster, don't need a color bar on here, do we? With the gray color map, I think. So you can see that it gives a nice sort of faux 3D effect. And this matches very strongly the sort of way that Google present it here. You can see that the, uh, the plane here is not, not dissimilar to the way Google does it here. So already we can start to calculate things which are not dissimilar to what, quotes real bits of software generate. What is this raster um, function, uh, what is this raster object that I generate with this open raster? Well, the way PowerGIS represents things is that a raster is actually two things. It's your data, which is a big bag of pixel values, but also implicitly along with this is uh, all of the data about the data. It's called metadata is the phrase. And this involves uh, knowledge of the projection used, how we actually convert between uh, two, d two numbers into a location on the Earth service, the linear scaling, uh, how do we convert projection coordinates into meters, and how do we actually uh, convert between actual pixel locations, I want the 30th pixel across and the 20th down, how do we convert that into an actually a projection coordinate that we can put on our map. And all that information is, is held in the metadata in the raster. Now, uh, let me just give you an example of how Python lets you very rapidly see problems that come up in data that you might not initially have seen uh, if you were playing with it in a, in a more traditional form of uh, GIS software. So I'm going to talk about something called the sampling problem. And this is uh, most evident, don't want to zoom in there, most evident if uh, we try to uh, plot what the actual elevations look like along a path. So suppose I wanted to get an elevation profile walking uh, from west to east around this area of the map. Oh, I happen to have um, loaded a notebook that does this. So first of all, let's um, import our libraries. I've also got a path library part of PyJS, which provides a useful number of things to do with working out points along paths and all those sort of things. So let's load our library and do our um, loading up of the elevation data set, um, drawing it and showing it on the screen. 
So this is all code that we've seen before. And there we go. Oops. I, I've commented out here an example of how you could actually get um, your own two points to plot a, a, a path between. The G input function helpfully lets you choose points off a map. But I'm going to choose two points I happen to know to be quite interesting. They are, if you draw a path between the 200, 200 pixel, so that's 200 pixels down, 200 pixels across, around here, to 400 pixels across and 200 down, so that'd be around here. So I'm going to create a path, which is just an array of those two numbers, and there it is. And I'm going to create a function which plots them. Now, because this is an array, um, I actually, the first column here is the x coordinate, and the second column is the y coordinate. And I can pass those directly to the plot function which is part of matplotlib, to actually draw that line. Um, the scale x and scale y here are just special things to say, um, don't re-zoom uh, into the image to try and make it fit. So let me zoom into roughly where the area of the, the path is going to be. I think it's going to be around here somewhere. And if I define that function and plot that path, there we go. Points online is a function that comes from PyGIS, and that basically says, um, given a particular spacing in real world units and a start point and end point give me all the points and the linear distances along that line if i show you what those look like so points see is an array of points that just take me from one corner all the way to the other with a lot of them and dists is just an array of distances. It's nicely truncated in there. Let's just delete that. We can plot all the elevations along that point. So this will plot our elevation map, um, our elevation plot going along this path so we can get some idea of how wiggly the, the world is. And we use that using the sample function of the um, elevation object. Now R, if we go back up here, R is the raster that I opened. And sample is a function which it has inside it, which given a set of um, projection coordinates will give me the value of the image at those points, the value of the rest of those points. So I'm going to plot as x-coordinates horizontal distances and y-coordinates the heights at that point. Oh, that's quite jaggedy. Why is that jaggedy? Well, you might say, well, perhaps I just haven't taken my points close enough together. But if I modify this plot function to actually... Um, put little x's where they've been sampled and zoom in somewhere, let's say zoom in up here, you can see that we are certainly taking enough um, points along the line, it's just the problem is that our pixel value is only defined, for, our pixels are about 30 meter wide pixels. And this sort of jaggedness means that if we tried to do any data analysis on here, we'd incorrectly assume that our landscape was very stepped, it was very jagged. So there is um, a particular um, technique that you can do to smooth this data in a way that's uh, mathematically correct is the best way in which I'm going to say this and that's something called Lanchos um, resampling and Lanchos resampling um, will always guarantee that at the center of the pixel it gives you the same number as if you just took that pixel value directly but as you move from one pixel to the other it smoothly changes the value in a way which and again, I'm going to gloss over this, is in some sense mathematically correct. You can look at the Wikipedia page if you really care. And the way we can do Lanchos um, sampling is to just uh, use this function, Lanchos sample, as opposed to sample. So if I do this, uh, it's overlaid my plots. And if I zoom in around here, you can see how um, at the center of every pixel, oops, zoom in again, there we go. At the cent oh Lord, pressing the wrong button several times. That's what I wanted. At the centre of every pixel, it goes through the actual value, but it moves smoothly between. So, does this really matter? You might ask. I mean, does who cares? Well, I'm going to give an example of now of uh, doing some exciting 3D plotting. And we don't need that slash in the end, do we? I've taken this 3D plotting example almost directly from the matplotlib examples. So I'm going to slightly gloss over how it works. Essentially what we want to do is we want to end up with three arrays, which is going to be these X, Y, and Z arrays down here. And they're going to give you um, 
the x coordinate of a particular point on a surface, a y coordinate of a particular point on the surface, and the z coordinates. And we're going to try and plot a height, a 3D height of the surface. And I happen to have chosen the um, pixels 235 to 245 in both x and y. And I've chosen that because I happen to know that, that area of the image is relatively interesting. So if we were to uh, plot, we plot our elevation and zoom in roughly that area, it's around here or somewhere. You can see that it's quite crinkly up here, so that's a sensible bit of to do. Uh, first, I'm going to say, well, what range of pixels do I want? So I use this thing called A range. So if I input, press Shift Enter on that, put in something below it. So Shift Enter to evaluate it. Um, see, X pixels are the pixels across that I want to look at, and Y pixels are the Y pixels I want to look at. And this mesh grid function. Um, just returns um, a 2D array where one of them is the X coordinate, one of them is the Y coordinate. And this here, again, I'm not going to explain it terribly um, in, in depth because uh, this is not going to be a complete Python tutorial, essentially um, unravels those X coordinates. We've seen the rebel command before. Um, uses pixels to projection to convert the projection coordinates and then puts them back together into this thing called or actually samples them using this thing called height sample and then these x y and z things use reshape to put it back into a square box so here if i show you you can see that x is now an array which gives us our x projection coordinates and z are going to be our heights we can plot it using um, the plot surface part of matplotlib and this takes our x, y, and z arrays and some uh, parameters that determine what it looks like and draws it. What's it going on here? Unknown projection. That's right, because we need to import the 3D part of matplotlib. And there we go. And you can see that it's quite an interesting area. It's got a sort of valley coming on. And uh, we might want to plot some contour plots of this, because this is quite an interesting load of places. So let's do a contour plot. We can do that using the contour f function, which will do a, a filled in contour plot with x, y, z. And we'll throw a color bar on the end of it. And there we go. It's not a very pretty cut a contour plot, though. It's quite sort of jaggedy, not very smooth. We've missed this valley at the bottom here. We appear to have sort of accidentally got a, a ridge on. And that's because we haven't really got that many pixel samples. So for example, if I were to actually show, uh, if I in show z see that's the pixels we've chosen in fact actually that's lying to us because it's doing a, an actual bit of interpolation when it's displaying it there we go so that's actually the uh pixels we've um sorry about that. that's actually the pixels we've um sampled and you can see it's not a very, very high resolution height map. So you'll sit there and you go, well, OK, I know what we can do. We can just increase our samplings. Uh, so instead of going one pixel across, let's go 0.25 pixels across. That should increase the resolution of our image, make our console plot look better. Then we go through, we do our thing, do our thing. And when we finally shift enter this, it looks horrible. And you can see here the problem with um, having pixel values defined only at their center and not doing any sort of smoothing, that if we were to use this as the input to another um, part of our analysis, we would get horribly wrong results. And these are the sort of subtleties that you don't often notice unless you're playing with data in GIS form. And because you are able now to play with it very rapidly and quickly with IPython, you get to have a real handle on what the data looks like. And if we try to plot a contour plot of that, it would look horrible. Now, if we were to um, just end up with our contour plot coming straight out of our software like this, we'd have no idea what's gone on. But the fact that we've actually laid out exactly what we've done in order to get this software in a way that we can go back and we can tweak things and change things, and there's a whole list of everything we've done, we don't have to remember, we don't have to worry about whether we touched a button at the wrong point, clicked a, a, a tick box that we shouldn't, and these sort of things. So how can we fix this? Well, the easiest way to fix it is just instead of you use uh, normal sampling, is change that into a, a large fish sample like that. Um, so we run through the whole data thing again. This is the, the joy of having it in actual program code. We can redo a particular set by simply moving the uh, 
uh, of selecting the appropriate cell and shift entering our way down. So this is doing the sampling, do all this, and then replot, and that's a far prettier surface. You see, we've got rid of all that steps. Um, at the actual centers of the pixels, it's still exactly the same number that our elevation data is presenting, but we have a very much more uh, pretty um, presentation of the data. And if we draw a contour plot from that, you can see that's a far better contour plot. It's far nicer. And we've got this valley back again. So doing this sort of, it's called um, uh, oversampling. We can oversample the elevation map and um, get nicer contour plots therefrom. So that's um, the problems with the, um, the sampling problem. And now I'm going to talk about how you can actually clean up data that you might have got from the, the web. Uh, so let's close that notebook and go for another notebook. Do I want to open? Oh, in fact, I'll open a new notebook. We'll do it, we'll do it live, um, as it were. We'll, we'll try and load it as we go. Um, so let's first of all import our raster library again. And I'm going to deal with some data that I downloaded off the web. So this data that I got here is very nice um, ordnance survey height map data. But you can download things um, from various NASA uh, space shuttle missions and satellite missions. And uh, I've just downloaded the ASTA data set for this area around Stonehenge and Avery um, to see how it compares. And you can just download this straight from the web and play with it. And if I look in the uh, directory here, it's actually this uh, data set here is, corresponds to the area we've been looking at. So we can open it, just as we have been seeing. So that's LAB equals raster. raster and if we plot it, there we go. So you can see that's, it's roughly the same area. We have um, that plain um, here and we have the, the I think there's a river valley that, that goes down here you can see it looks already a lot less pretty than the data we had before it looks a little bit sort of spotty and noisy in places and also we notice here the projection coordinates uh, they go from minus one to minus two so this is not the British national grid anymore and in fact if we um, print out projection you can see that it is indeed um, degrees and not meters so we have this problem now where we're not going to be able to get directly into our linear scaling I happen to know however that in this part of the world one degree is roughly about 11 uh, 100, 111 kilometers that will change depending on where you are in the world but in this data set it's true so for my convenience and again this is slightly lying I can specify a linear scale as in something I have to multiply projection coordinates by to actually get um, to real on the world data why does this matter well let's see let's try and plot a, um, a embossed image from here so if I do emboss elevation emboss Oh yeah, what's going on here? Out of memory, I should uh, try to be careful. Let's save this as foo and then just uh, quit IPython and start again. This can happen sometimes if you've got uh, stuff bunged up. Let's reload. No, it's actually need to start it would be good, wouldn't it? There we go, I called it foo. Where we were. So let's actually uh, import raster, import our elevation, and show it. There we go. Again, this is the nice thing about um, having actually a sort of programming based approach is that um, if you do get sort of slight programming glitches or, or points where your, your program slightly dies, you haven't lost your work. You can get back to where you were very, very rapidly. Let's find an emboss thing. Let's have a think. 
this is a very much higher a higher spatial resolution data set so it takes a more longer to think about it and let's show that embossed yep let's be C oh what's going on here this is no longer the prettiness that we had I and mean, if we zoom in you see what's this it just it's all bobbly and noisy and black and horrible and that's because um it in the absence of any knowledge of linear scale it's had to assume that what the projection coordinates are one-to-one -one mapping to meters which means that although you might be going up and down only a few hundred meters it thinks this entire square is only one meter by one meter square big which is definitely not true so we have to tell it how big a linear scale is and you do that with a linear scale parameter not here you do that when you actually open it And I happen to know it's about 111 kilometers. So now if I show my elevation, it looks much the same, but when I do my embossing and show that. That's where I could do with some hold music. Memory error again. Goodness, what's what's going on? I've I've got, obviously got something that's eating up a, a large chunk of memory somewhere. see if I can remove some program ah there we go I found a whole other version of iPython that was uh, uh, hiding on a different monitor there we go There we go. That's more like it. And you can see here it's it's still noisy, but it's more like we were expecting. So this linear scale parameter is important, and if um, you have got something which is in degrees and not in actual meters, then uh, it can be a, a small problem. I think my presentation may have died as well. There we go. Moving on from this particular um, aspect, what, what can we do with this uh, data to try and clear it up? Well, the problem is uh, that it's just too noisy. The actual height um, data itself has got an error, such as a bit of noise, a bit of wobble. And according to the Aster website, that can be uh, somewhere around 7 meters, which when we're dealing with sort of elevations between 100 to 200 meters is, is non-trivial. So let's actually uh, look at how we can fix that. And we're going to fix that by changing the data within the raster. And we're going to do that using something called a similar raster. Now the idea is that um, what if we want to change this data? Well, we can't just pull the data out and do some stuff on it because then we lose all this meta metadata. So instead you want to create a, a similar raster from a prototype raster and some new data. And this um, approach very simply takes the metadata from a prototype and combines it with some new data to form a similar raster. So it keeps all our projection information around, uh, all our linear scale information around and things like that, um, but allows us uh, to do image processing on this. Uh, so I'm going to pull out the data, the actual height data from this raster, and do something called a Gaussian blur. And a Gaussian blur is a good way to get rid of this noise. As an example, here we have um, a half-toned image, which is not dissimilar to our sort of noise. It's sort of bobbly, but there's only a picture. And this is what happens when you put a ga Gaussian blur over it. Still slightly mottly, but it's certainly less uh, painful than it was. So we want to create, um, uh, this is called low-pass filtering in simulation processing terms, by the way, so you have a fan fancy name to know what's going on. If we want to uh, do this, we need to first of all pull the data out. So elev data, and unsurprisingly, that's actually just the data parameter inside, the data uh, variable inside elev. 
and we want to be able to Gaussian blur it. Now this is an example of where Python lets you uh, combine multiple tools together because someone else has written a bit of code that does a Gaussian blur on an array. It's unrelated to GIS, first never thought it would be um, applicable to GIS, they wrote it for utterly another reason, but because um, Python is sort of universal glue that can stick things together, we can actually um, make use of all of this um, code that's been written by other people. And uh, the module that uh, implements this Gaussian blur for us is called numarray, and inside it it's got another module called ND image. And I found this from Googling Gaussian Blur and Python, so you too can find this. So let's create the low passed version of the data. And you do this using the uh, I think it's Gaussian filter it tab. Gaussian filter, there we go. One of the nice things about IPython is if you open a bracket and then wait too long, it prints out a little sort of usage information about how to actually use the, the function. Uh, and I happen to know that you type in the image you want, which is going to be LF data, and how many pixel Y you want the blur to be. Well, we've got quite a high resolution image, so I think four pixels isn't too much. It should make us have a nice smoother look without get losing too much detail. And there we go, it's now done the blur. So now we just need to create a similar raster from this data so that we can display it on the screen. So LF LP is raster, similar raster. We give it the data and then the prototype. And let's actually call it LF LP. And that's done a slight blur over it. If we zoom in, you can see that it, it has that sort of mottly effect that we had in the example with the, the eyes down below. You see how that same sort of mottling going on. I um, now want to convert that into an emboss thing. So emboss LP is equal to There we go. And hopefully this should look actually nicer. Now I created a little bit of code here in the other window, which was the other version of IPython I had running, which was causing my memory problems. Um, and this uh, will helpfully show the two side by side so we can compare them using something called subplots. So if I run that, and there we go. So this makes the window full screen. You can see here's the original and here's the filtered, which is far more like the embossed uh, maps we've been expecting. So this gives you an idea of how to uh, filter exciting data. Now, as soon as we have filtered it, we can start to see sort of details that we may have missed before. So for a start, what the hell is this over here? If I zoom in. What on earth is that? I think that's a face. There's a face on the earth. There's a face just like there's a face on Mars. There's a face on Mars. It's a rather ugly face, but it's definitely a face. Well, what is that? What's that? I mean, we're around Stonehenge, Navery. Perhaps it's King Arthur's burial mound or something. Well, we can actually answer these questions, right? This is the whole point of doing this uh, thing. We've started with some data, which is noisy. I mean, you can kind of see it up here, but it really pops out when you do the Gaussian blur. Uh, and we can actually find out what it is. Now, um, if I move my mouse over the image, and if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of the actual figure image, down here somewhere, you can see that uh, the actual coordinates are displayed. This is the advantage of using um, show raster function, because uh, these are actually projection coordinates. So I know that the center of my little um, anomaly, which I'm going to try and discover what it is, is at um, x is minus 1.35 and y is 51.75, which corresponds to uh, 1.35 degrees um, which direction west and 51.75 degrees north what on earth is that well this is where we can actually combine multiple things together so let's go back to our uh, publicly accessible uh, GIS software which is Google Maps again you can see my memory issues were there and Google Maps have got a very nice feature whereby you can just type in a latitude and longitude and get directly there so 1.35 west 51.75 north. 
So is this going to be an unmarked hill? Is this going to be an exciting uh, building? Perhaps we found Area 51. Let's have a search. And we found the Farmore Reservoir. Ah. Well, it's the right shape. I mean, look, yeah, sort of squat, squarey shape. I think that's probably about right. Um, well, that's not as exciting as you might have thought. But at least we've answered a research question. We posed a scientific question and we found out what it was. And we've done that by combining IPython and our Google Maps service together into one. Disappointing, but there we go. Most of Oxfordshire really is. Well, that's about all I've got to say. Thank you for watching. I um, hope you found this useful, maybe even inspiring. Who knows? And uh, apologies for the memory issues that my computer had. Obviously, doing stream casting and data processing and uh, having another version of IPython open at the same time uh, made it stutter a bit. Um, also, apologies if my screen, re screen recording software didn't like me swapping virtual desktops around. It can be a bit twitchy about that sort of thing. The source code for um, PyGS is available at the URL on screen. It's very much a work in progress at the moment. As I said, I've been spending about two weeks doing this. And it's pretty much my own notes and my own scribbles for the moment. But if you want to use it as a basis for writing your own code or to see how this all works, feel free to have a look. All right, I've been Rich Rome. Thank you very much for listening.